right, strap in. This is going to be a deep episode. Um, and I have an entire book to get through, you know? So we're going to talk about theosophy. And we're not going to talk about OG original Blavatsky theosophy. I'm going to breeze past that because there, there's a reason <coughs> for that. So just to like get into the source of what theosophy is, hmm. in the late 1800s, there was someone named Helena Blavatsky, right. as you guys know, but for the listener. Sure. Um, and she was a Ukrainian woman. It's about like 1877, I think, is when she published her first book. She goes over to Tibet. She stays at an ashram there, studies under a Tibetan master for years, and apparently, you know, got to the point to where she was able to telepathically communicate with um, enlightened masters. And so before we really get into this, I want to talk about why theosophy is particularly so fascinating. And and truly, it's probably like one of the biggest rabbit holes I've ever yeah. <laughs> stumbled across. So um, ob- it's no secret. We're very into, you know, like the wisdom traditions and, and the belief of, you know, there being some sort of primordial eternal truth that has existed in secret, uh-huh. you know, throughout the aeons or whatever. And um, reading through Rosicrucian manuals, they make it apparent very early on that that they give credit to her by name. Helena Blavatsky is one of the like prominent figures in modern times Mm. who is responsible for bringing the eternal wisdom (coughs) tradition to public knowledge. So like what I'm getting at is the Rosicrucians are saying she's very serious. She's very for real. Like read her works. The good news about theosophy is it's not like most orders where first of all, it's not a religion. It's not like anything that requires worship or anything like that. It doesn't even require belief. You know, you can go into this very detached and just with an open mind read and, and you know, kind of study this material. It's vast, it's expansive, and every bit of it is publicly available online. It's, yeah, and, and what is the goal of theosophy? Well, I'm going to get into Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. I have a, I, I'm going to go over an entire theosophy book cool, in a very yeah. quick span here. Hell yeah. Um, and so just to kind of wrap this part up, Um, you know, you go into a very detached open mind, but the point is theosophy is probably the, oh, I was going to say that it doesn't require any sort of initiations like all these other secret societies. Sure. It's not like that. It's more like a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, here's the material that it doesn't really matter if you believe it, you know? And it's like a synthesis of all esoteric knowledge compiled into one concise, complete summary of like, here's what it is. Here's why it's relevant. Here's, here's why you should understand this material. You know, here's what you're going to do with it. So, um, around the, I believe it was the 1920s. There was another prominent figure from theosophy, uh, who, who was named Alice Bailey and she developed even more material in the same way, like from being a high level theosophist, um, you know, speaking with enlightened masters or whatever, and then coming forth with more material. And then finally in the 1970s, there was the last and most recent one, Benjamin Krim, a Scottish philosopher, esotericist, whatever. Sounds like a Harry Potter character. It does. Yeah. And he's Scottish too. Hogwarts <laughs> oh, cool, is in cool. Scotland. Nice. But um, anyway, so Benjamin Krim, and then he came forth and then like completed so to speak, theosophy. Uh, so if you think about theosophy, there's there's the three main people who are coming forth and being like, this is the material. Helena, Alice, and Helena, Benjamin. Alice, and Benjamin. Each time these people came forward, it became more simple. It became less fluff. If you look here, I have one and a half of uh, Helena Blavatsky's main works, and she really has like nine books. Each of these are well over a thousand pages. Like this is two volumes of Isis Unveiled, probably a thousand pages. The Secret Doctrine, this is only volume two. There's two volumes. Whoa. It's it's massive. And a lot of it is fluff. A lot of it is written from the tone of a very um, oppressed Ukrainian woman mm. in the 1800s mm. who was desperately trying to like fight back against mainstream Christianity and mm. a lot of the language and the attitude and the tone she uses is very like you know in your face you're wrong as these other people came forward they they were a lot more uh exact <laughs> With revealing the information. Sure, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. we're going to focus on Benjamin Krim today. Cool. So um, there's this book that is completely, it's just so fascinating. It's called The Ageless Wisdom. Uh, the Ageless Wisdom Teachings, I believe. And it's like basically a very thorough and concise, like this is exactly what theosophy teaches, what is believed. 
here's the truth about reality. Here you go. And then there's even more books that I'm working on reading right now. Like there's a book by Alice Bailey called um, Initiation, Human and Solar, Mm -hmm. which is like a very high level overview of like what they actually mean when they say initiation. We're just going to touch on that a tiny, tiny little bit today. So mostly we're talking about Benjamin Krim. Yes. Who you said was the most recent. The most recent since the 1970s. Gotcha. Yeah. And personally, he's my favorite because, again, like, you know, there's decades spanning these people. It's not like they met in real life. Yeah, yeah. But they were a part of the same society. And these three are recognized as being the the main figures, you know, bringing forth the knowledge. So Benjamin Krim is just super cool, super fascinating. And um, this book is really deep. I did want to start this real quick, though. A quote from Isis Unveiled, Volume 1 in the introduction, just so people understand like the the groundwork for this. She says, Elena Blavatsky says, our work then is a plea for the recognition of the hermetic philosophy, the anciently universal wisdom religion as the only possible key to the absolute in science and theology. Oh, so that's bold. It's bold. That's bold. It's bold. It's very hermetic. It's, it's, it's all about this, you know, Atlantis and all the stuff we talk about, but it's like, it's the one-stop shop to find all the information. No more in today's society. Dude, and I say this because like, I spent years, years to get to this point to where I could like access this information and read it and understand that it's like a verifiable source mm. of this material. I mean, come on, like everybody knows there's these silly groups out there like the Masons, the Templars, the OTO. They have these secret rituals. You got to pay membership. You got to basically be, you know, like hazed into understanding yeah. these. They lie to you through so many levels of initiation. There's no clue like what their real purpose is. It's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's old it's lame. It's like obfuscated. It's super, obfuscated yeah. on purpose. Yeah. Here's the material. Here is what all of these people who are getting like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of like membership dues every year mm-hmm. and all your friends put on your Mason Shriner hats and you go on a Friday night and you have a silly ritual where you're in your robes walking around a candle and people are reading strange material at you and then afterwards you go to the pub down the street and you know, everybody has a beer and laugh about it. Yeah. All that's done. Right. You don't need that shit anymore. This is the material. This this is this is it. This so, is the um, way. so the source of the teachings is very important. So this is I'm gonna read things that are directly from Benjamin Krim. Hell yeah. And then, you know, we kinda like talk about that. So this book is styled it was obviously written probably like in the seventies or eighties. Um, it is a, it is an interview format between someone who has like no knowledge of any of this. And then the answers are coming from Benjamin, but I've cropped out a lot of the like answer question format and just grabbed the material. Oh, cool. Cool. So the source of the teachings, the question was like, what's the source? Where does it come from? How is it authentic? Uh, the ageless wisdom teachings is as old as humanity itself. This is the teachings of a group of men who have gone beyond the strictly human stage and have entered the next kingdom, mm. the spiritual kingdom. They are the masters of wisdom and the lords of compassion. They are men and women like us who have expanded their consciousness to include the spiritual levels. There are a large number of these enlightened men um, on our planet who have been living in the remote mountain and desert areas for countless years. Uh. From time to time, they release aspects of their teachings in so far that we can absorb and use them to enlighten us, like the collective consciousness. Um, in modern times, the major expression of this teaching was given through Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society between 1875 and 1890. Her book, The Secret Doctrine, is the preparatory phase of the teaching given for the new cosmic cycle we are now entering, which is known as the Age of Aquarius. Whoa. A later phase was given through an English disciple, Alice A. Bailey. Every new cosmic cycle, we are entering a new one. Now, the Age of Aquarius brings a world teacher. People like Hercules, Hermes, Rama, Mithra, Vyasa, Zoroaster, Confucius, Krishna, Shankaracharya, the Buddha, the Christ, Muhammad. These are all masters who came from the same spiritual center of the planet called the spiritual or esoteric hierarchy, which is made up of the masters and their initiates and disciples of various degrees. It is also known as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of souls. So like the 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 literal belief here in theosophy, and again, it's like, how can we prove this? Right, uh, right of course. The literal belief is that these people, through studying the the path of enlightenment for so many years and developing mastery over their physical, mental, emotional, and astral bodies are able to telepathically communicate with disembodied souls existing in another realm. The souls who, you know, apparently achieved rainbow body or light body 
have become eternal, have moved on. Sure, yeah. But they communicate with us in order to guide us. You know, so like, for example, according to them, Jesus reached light body, <coughs> still exists in another realm, yeah, yeah. dispensing information. And it's like every few aeons or thousands of years, they think about it like a Wi-Fi and they allow us to interface with them to receive the next levels of the teaching so that we evolve in this plane. Wow. Right. It, it would almost be like if somebody was able to interface and communicate with the orbs. You know yes. what I'm saying? Like, because, you know, like the Buddhists believe, like, that's what you turn into, basically. Right. When you become enlightened or rainbow there, body. There, there are theosophical books about UFOs and what they are. And, dude, the mind blowing thing is a lot of this stuff jives with, like, what has been coming to us. I went to a crystal shop recently and they had a bunch of books. One row is theosophy, directly under was UFOs. Wow. Yeah, it was like right in your face. I think Benjamin Krim wrote a UFO theosophical book. And oh, they, they talk about orbs and light beings. And th I mean, like, spoiler, we're light beings. Yeah, right, you know? right, right, Like, right. it's all the same stuff. So God, what is God from the theosophical perspective? God, in the esoteric meaning, is the sum total of all the laws and all the energies governed by these laws in the manifested and unmanifested universe. God is impersonal, technically, meaning there's not one being sitting on a throne. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yes. It's, it's the combined energy of everything in all existence and non-existence. Um, nevertheless, that transcendent God is manifest in every aspect of creation, mm. including ourselves. We are not separate from that creation, from God. Every human being has the potential of the knowledge, the awareness of all in creation that we can think of as meaning God. Think about how in the Bible when Jesus said when he was leaving... He said, if, you know, if you have the belief of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain, you can be as I am and perform miracles as I do if you just had the faith. Yeah. He's, it's, it's secret. You know, we are like him. We are like God. Yeah, that's what, that's what came into my mind when you were reading that, like, be like Christ. Mm -hmm. The masters are God realized, which is a very specific state in that they have brought their consciousness in terms of the divine spark, the absolute, the self, and to complete atonement, or as you could say, at one men, um, with themselves as men on the physical plane. Plane, the personality and divine aspect are uh, totally integrated. God is everything that exists in all space between that which exists between you and me and around us, around everything, all of that is God. God manifests through its creation, which is made of energies at particular vibrational rates. The form depends on the particular frequency of the nucleus and the electrons of these forms. Modern science has been able to break down the cellular structures. This is him speaking in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, break down the cellular structures and show that at the center of every atom is a nucleus with electrons all around it, vibrating at a specific rate, and that every atom in the universe is made in the same way. There is nothing but energy in all of the manifested universe. Yeah. So it's consciousness. <laughs> yeah. You know? It, yeah. It's, it's, it's like the force. That's I I love comparing it to that because it is like a perfect allegory. But yeah, it it's like, you know, like hardcore scientists will use things like that to refute spirituality. Mm -hmm. But it's like bro, it's You're kind of it, bro. <laughs> it's kind of inherently spiritual. Like everything is the same thing, like everything's vibrating at a frequency. The tiniest atom has a brain, a nucleus, you know? Mm -hmm. Has it's like as above so below is yeah. everywhere. This is the definition of as above so below. It's like I love that. you know when you when when you understand what that means, it's the microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm. And you know, what is microcosm? What is macrocosm? Think like this. You're a living human being. You have trillions of little cells on your arm. If you have the ability or the perception to zoom in and watch these cells, let's just say you become a cell and you watch them on their day to day. Those cells have jobs. Yeah. They have a, they have a, so to speak, a thought or a consciousness that says, I gotta, I gotta do some work here. And they, they are have aware. a function. They're aware they're in some aware. way. Yeah. In some way they're aware. Uh -huh. Just like the blade of grass is aware. Or Dude, even, even um, like uh, slime mold, which has no nucleus, has no quote unquote brain or mind, it still can make decisions. And right. It, it can still move and, right. and, you know, they've tested it and proven it. it it's like weird. It's Bro, like, they've, they've proven a single photon of light is aware. Yeah. The it, double slit experiment. Exactly. Like it, when, when the light is aware that you are aware of it. Yeah. It knows you're watching. This it. is proven. Yeah. It, you know it, what I'm saying? Scientifically like, proven. And this is, this is what I'm saying. How, why is science so like bent on disproving spirituality? It's the same thing. Yeah. 
Science is just explaining spirituality. I mean, that's what esotericism truly is in its peak form. When you understand, it's like the knowledge that science and spirituality are truly one thing working together to yeah. prove that we are eternal beings reincarnating, you know, in, in this consciousness plane or whatever. Yeah. That's, this, that's one of the material plane, you know, that's what's so dope about theosophy is it's like, why, why we got to be black or white? Why, why can't we be in the middle? Why, why can't it be all one thing? You know, if you look into quantum physics, it's like magic. Yes, yeah. It, yeah. di- literally. On it, it's you can't distinguish it from. I mean, bro, magic. all the Marvel movies are literally like based on quantum physics now, and they do magic and stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, quantum media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, quantum physics. It's yeah. like magic. Yeah, it really is spooky action. That's what Einstein yeah. called. Yeah, it's well, spooky he called action a specific, at a distance. You know, quantum physics thing. Yeah. So the next part is very. Uh, this was kind of like new information to me, and it's 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 really cool, but it's like really strange it's really far out there love it so i didn't write a lot about it because it's a very complex subject okay but it's it anyway i'm interested so the theosophists believe it's it's what is known as this part is not what's so out there it's what is known as let me find the exact word it is septenary the idea of the septenate so sept meaning seven Mm. so it's apparent that that something about the number seven is present in every form of creation right okay there's seven colors of the rainbow there's seven notes on a musical scale right Uh, uh okay um seven uh seven hermetic laws seven days of the week God created the, you know, in Genesis, God created the world basically in six days. And then on the seventh, he rested. There's, there's always something about the number seven, uh, denoting some sort of structure that makes the cycle complete. Mm -hmm. It's a divine number in most cultures and religions. So here's why the theosophists have this principle known as the seven rays. Mm. And the belief is that there are seven primordial cosmic rays that are this eternal energy that flow through all things and each of these seven rays um, which are also depicted by numbers and I believe they may be depicted as co- uh, colors they they dictate the archetypal energy of all things including wow. including people and their personalities countries planets solar system your soul's incarnation between lives it dictates everything in the known manifested universe Whoa. so to read from the book esoteric science postulates seven streams of energy or rays whose interaction at every conceivable frequency creates everything in cosmos each ray is the expression of a great cosmic life psychically de- demonstrating its unique energetic quality through the vehicles in which it manifests we are the vehicles right the human sure. the human being is the vehicle of consciousness whether it be a grain of sand, a man, or a solar system. To say that a man or a nation or a planet is on the first or second ray, for example, is to say that they are controlled by and express the quality of that ray. The idea of the septinate is found at many levels and in many branches of our lives. The seven colors of the rainbow, Uh. the seven notes on the musical scale, the seven planes of existence, the seven sacred planets, ETC. and Seven chakras? Yes. Like seven chakras. Seven energy bodies? Exactly. It's always seven. It's always seven. When, 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 When manifest Testing, you know, some structure. And in keeping with this scream, uh, scheme, there are seven ray types of people. And there's a lot more on the seven rays that I was like, dude, I don't even know where to begin with this. So I, I <laughs> left it at that. So very far out there concept. And um, apparently you can determine like which ray dictates your personality and everyone's different. Whoa. But uh, alternatively, each of us incarnating with the energy influence of, you know, one of these particular rays Again, it's as above, so below. On the macrocosmic scale, with us entering in the age of Aquarius, apparently the influence of the rays are shifting. And that's why we're, you know, according to this, leaving the influence of the sixth ray. And then when Aquarius truly dawns on us, will be the influence of the seventh cosmic ray. Whoa. Which is like there's a literal energetic force changing us. Like, oh like shining energy through our souls that will be changing us from the inside out. Wow. Okay, so you mentioned you could potentially like find the ray that dictates your personality. Mm-hmm. How? Just studying it, and then supposedly you're supposed to read them all, and there's a way to, you know, it's like your intuition guides you. you no, know, it's okay. like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. There's no sign. There's no, I don't know the exact science. There's not this. a BuzzFeed quiz. There's not a buzz. <laughs> I mean, there might be. You have to remember, like, 
as far as like esotericism is concerned, theosophy is like at the very rock bottom bedrock of the rabbit hole. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's as deep as it goes. I would say level one is like Freemasons, yeah. <laughs> Illuminati. That's that's like people who are aware that there's something going on, but they're really not initiated into like what it all means. Uh-huh. You know, like we've all been there. We all find out there's secret societies running the world and we're all like at first, like they worship the devil. Ah, it's so scary. It's like, they don't. They really don't all worship. Right, 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 you know? right. They don't. Yeah. It's, there's probably like a handful. That, there's always going to be people who. There's are, yeah. There's always dark stuff. Yeah. yeah, and there is dark stuff. And I'm not trying of to course. trivialize that. Yeah, you know the, the elements of that are true. Theosophy goes to great lengths actually to warn against dark sorcery, dark occultism. They call it the Black Lodge. They, they're, uh, like they have they have like extensive material. Because in masonry, they call the White Lodge. That's theosophy. Or, oh, oh, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. The, gotcha. The White Lodge. Right. So, I think I brushed past this, but that's what they call this other realm where these enlightened masters supposedly reside, like Buddha and Christ and all the White Lodge. And and this fraternity of enlightened masters is known as the Great White Brotherhood. Wow. That is wild. And then, of course, the antithesis of that would be the Black Lodge, which Uh is like the very real people today who are manipulating occult knowledge for very bad, nefarious means to like hinder us the ordinary everyday people from understanding this knowledge wow i I may be getting ahead of you or ahead of myself or whatever so if if the if the white lodge has these these like archetypal christ-like figures are there dark figures within the black lodge that are dark archetypal figures there are but i didn't like go that far sure sure yeah yeah yeah. but yes i i I could only assume you know because it's like like i'm not gonna say that like oh hitler's there you know what i mean like i I don't know like a living person (laughs) but voldemort's there yeah but it's a thing yeah yeah yeah. and they're very open about like it's it's the it's because of the so to speak black lodge that we fell from atlantis hold up uh that sounds a lot like kingdom hearts like the uh, there's in Kingdom Hearts, there's like seven hearts of pure light and seven. thirteen hearts of pure darkness, and that that's like and the darkness they're always decked out in black robes, and then the other ones they use light as their like power. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah, sorry, I'm saying, dude, I got to bring up Kingdom oh, Hearts. <laughs> I forgot to even mention the other reason I you know dove into Theosophy as of recently is because I recently in the past couple years, um. Shout out Jim Simivan. He's he's Shout one out. of one of the guys who wrote the. It was either the forward or the introduction of my dad's book. And um, one of the things he told me on the phone one time, we st- I, I just started talking to him like, man, I've been really diving into like esotericism lately and hermeticism and Gnosticism. It's very fascinating stuff. And he was like, yeah, I'm very interested in like the Theosophists and Blavatsky, and it's like just such a you know amazing topic of study. And he told me like, I really do believe that uh, in the past we were like a precursor godlike race of beings who uh-huh. fell into materiality. Like he was like Atlantis. Like you philosophy, know? yeah, right like yeah. from Atlantis, yeah, it's all the same stuff. And he was indicating to me like he's he's really interested in it. And then the other thing is, you know, reading the Rosicrucian material where they literally blatantly say like we okay, so the Rosicrucians, very fascinating group. I think they're probably my favorite secret society because they're pretty clear about claiming that they are the oldest secret wisdom tradition known to mankind and they claim that their lineage comes all the way back to the times of the pharaoh thutmose the third who this is like post atlantis obviously but all these different egyptian temples and mystery schools are teaching all this stuff in secret and the pharaoh thutmose the third was like damn this is interesting (laughs) you know what i mean so he decreed that all these schools would be united into one one mystery school and the rosicrucians the rosicrucians claimed that they are that school. Oh, and whoa. like there's there's very real evidence that they have been operating in the world since at least the 1600s, and like whoa. there there were manifestos popping up all around Europe from the Rosicrucians claiming that they've been hiding in secret for aeons, waiting for humanity to be on the cusp of get this, the age of Aquarius. Wow. For them to make themselves public to like dispense the knowledge. Okay, and let me let me just piggyback off that for a second. Sixteen hundreds. You know, they don't know how old the pyramids or the Sphinx are. Exactly. And they they believe that they are actually so much older than we originally thought. Um, they're also learning that like 
they channel energy literally from the bottom to the top. The pyramids, it's, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like it's like they are they're they're starting to discover that they might actually be extremely high tech like structures like, like energy conduits yes, or something. Yes, energy exactly, yeah. energy conduits. So if if those things were built by let's just say the Atlantean society, you right. know, the pyramids, the sphinx and whatever, and then now you're talking about they're in hiding until the age of Aquarius and we also know of a little alignment that's supposed to happen in a few years mm-hmm. uh, aligning with the sphinx. Yep. So if we're following that same thread, then like this is real. The, yeah, and they mapped out when exactly when that was going to happen, they built the Sphinx to be like a, a precise, compass. Yeah. yeah, a compass to the you know, it's like, but dude, the, the craziest part, which is what you just said, is like, dude, think about my dad. He's a he's like a Baptist and a Pente- I say Baptist because he was born Baptist and then married my mom and became Pentecostal. Mm. Dude, he started having experiences in 2007. He's like, we're like, this is weird, you know, we we you know, we think they're angels or whatever, but like. <laughs> What the heck, you know? Yeah, yeah. Then in 2012, he sees this l- female entity, and she starts coming out talking about the age of Aquarius. Yeah. Dude, we had never talked about that, never heard of that. My mom knew the song from the 1960s, right, but right, that's yeah. it. Like, yeah. it's just weird. And then, like, me, you know, learning about that in 2012 from my dad, and she's showing him all the Egyptian pyramids and all this crazy stuff, and then I spend the next... I guess it's 11 years now going down these rabbit holes trying to corroborate my dad's experiences with all this ancient material and they very plainly say it's all about the age of Aquarius. It's like something's happening here. Yeah, that was one of the things that always jumped out to me is that like, yeah, your dad came from a completely Southern Christian background and then all of a sudden he has this experience and now he's talking about Egyptian gods and like all this crazy mystical stuff. I'm like, and then and then going back and finding it in ancient historical right. texts, corroborating that this information, <clears throat> it didn't. He didn't just make it up. Yeah, it's like do it's you, ancient. Did he? It's like did he sit around and super quickly read all of these thousands of years worth of history? No, he was told this right. by a spirit, right? By a spirit, and then we're going back and being like, oh, it's real, like. They've been writing about this for thousands of years. Right. That's that is the most mind blowing piece it's of this spooky. to me. It is spooky. It's very spooky. I mean, it's like it, it's a it's a huge indicator to me that it is real. And then another thing, which like I don't think people really get this part because my dad doesn't talk a lot publicly about reincarnation. Uh-huh. But like I'm telling you, when I was like 15, 16, 17, out of nowhere, one day my dad just started talking about reincarnation Mm. and like the beings imposed on him that, you know, it's what's up. And like, I didn't believe in reincarnation even until I was like, like a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, he just out of the blue starts talking about reincarnation. I remember being a teenager and he's showing me all these videos on kids claiming they're like, you know, I I can remember my past life. There's like documentaries about it. Oh, really interesting. I've seen tons of those videos. It's that's one of the things that got me fully believing in reincarnation. These little three and four year old kids giving full accounts of former lives that they go back and find records. Right. And corroborate the information. Like they have like dreams of like, specific details in life and then this documentary crew will take them to the other country they claim they're from and like the grave is there and like it all checks out like it's wild yeah. stuff yeah oh yeah wild stuff yeah but um yeah so that my point with that is like this this material theosophy like it it's it's one of the most important things about it is reincarnation and karma wow it's crazy but yeah anyway so moving on from the rays the rebirth and rays. reincarnation Evolutionary progress is based on the process of rebirth. Reincarnation is the method of our evolution of consciousness. Mm. Every thought, every action that we have under this law sets in motion a cause. We are creating causes all the time. The effects stemming from all these causes make our lives good or ill. At Mm. this moment, we are making the rest of this life and our next life. We are receiving what is called karma. The law of karma is the law of cause and and effect. The effects from our previous deeds, good and bad, create the conditions of our life today. And the results of our deeds today create the conditions of the next period of life, either now or when we return in our next body. The soul magically creates a series of bodies through which it can eventually really demonstrate itself as a soul. At that point, we are well on the way towards the end of the evolutionary 
cycle. It takes hundreds of thousands of incarnations per soul. Yeah. But once that point is reached and the soul looking at its reflection, the man or woman in incarnation sees that it is beginning to respond to the soul's quality and is becoming more divine, more unselfish, more altruistic, more concerned for other people and not just for the satisfaction of its own desires. It stimulates the vehicle and begins a process which ends the evolutionary journey, the process of initiation. Wow. Initiation has been brought into life to speed up the evolutionary process. It is not essential we could evolve without it, but it would take millions and millions of years to get to that point right. where we are today. Mathematically, if you think about it, every single soul has to go through hundreds of thousands of incarnations. Yeah, that would be so many millions of years. Exactly. If there was no initiation right, phase. Right. Um, there are five great planetary initiations to perfection. Jesus taught reincarnation. Mm -hmm. He even in the gospel, he makes comments about John being the second coming of Elias which is an Old Testament prophet. And then... It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's like, he, come on, it's right there. And then, exactly. And then there's another, uh, there's a parable about a child being born blind. And then Jesus asks the people listening, like how, who, they ask him, or no, no, he asks them, so who sinned, the child or the father? Mm. Think about it. What do you mean sinned? He was born blind. Yeah. Previous life. Right, yeah. Who sinned for this child to be born blind? Oh my God. But that's, that's, it just goes right over people's heads. Of course, because I mean, you're, you're trained to completely ignore anything about reincarnation. And then exactly like, I think we said this in the very first episode, let's get mystical. Um, Benjamin Krim says this right here in the text. The guy asks Benjamin Krim, well, wh why is reincarnation so prevalent in the East, but it's not mentioned in Western traditions? And he says it was, it's just the Emperor Justinius erased it. There you, it they had the yeah. second council of Constantinople and you can look this up. It's history. They had the second Second Council of Constantinople, mm -hmm. and they put a decree banning reincarnation. Yep, it's real history, mm -hmm. literally. They decreed all kinds of stuff there. They they decreed when Jesus's birthday was. They decreed that he was like a divine entity, and you know he was like an incarnation of, you know, God and all this stuff, and and that he didn't go around teaching reincarnation. Yeah. It's like uh, that was Constantine who did the birthday thing. Oh, oh, right, but right, right. But it's all right. the same authorities right. making these decrees. Yeah, that's yeah. what I, yeah. But yeah. yeah, both are true. They're just different times. But yeah, it's crazy. So like, what does that mean? If, 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 if this is true, which I know without a shadow of a doubt it is, that means in the ancient past, every civilization was teaching reincarnation. Every one of them. It's, it's because I feel like it's because they were connected with nature. You, you know what I mean? They, they, like I just saw, you know, uh, Dr. Sebi. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, like he was talking about how like, you know, he would go to these remote jungles and locations and ask for healing herbs and he would ask the people he would buy it from, what's this supposed to be good for? And they would say like, oh, it's good for your blood. It's good for uh, inflammation, whatever. And he would take it back to America to the most prestigious uh, like laboratories and have them test it. And they'd be like, it's good for blood. It's good for, for inflammation. And he said it told him they are connected to nature. How do they know that? He said the gorilla, the gorilla in the jungle doesn't have a laboratory. Right. He knows what to eat. He knows what his body needs because he's right. connected to nature. He was like curing people of cancer with these treatments. Oh, yeah. And they killed him for it. Right. I mean, yeah. the, the straight up. I mean, it's a conspiracy, but right. like. But it's, come on. Yeah, come on now. Yeah. There's a it, lot of headlines that pop up, holistic doctors just suddenly dying out of nowhere. It's, it's, this whole modern society is designed to distract us. Money. Yeah, well, that's the biggest distraction. You know what's funny about that? What? So check it out. I'm not going to cover this in the material, but okay. we can still talk about it. The theosophists are pretty open about this, that there is like this spiritual corruption taking place in many facets of society. And in modern times, the dominant, Corruption is actually the economics. Oh, dude, absolutely. That's that's where it's it's like from a spiritual perspective, there is a force crippling humanity through the economic sector, bro. At least here in America, where I can speak of, I mean, we we we're like batteries. We 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 live. We have to make money and survive. You'll go to jail if you don't pay your taxes. Literally, <laughs> like, literally. Like like we are. It's beat into our heads from the day we're born. Like. You got to make money. If you don't, you won't survive. You know, I, I think true progress is spiritual. Yes. True progress is energetic. It's emotional. It's, it's mental. It's the mind. Yeah. It's not 
it's not like buildings and inventions yeah. and the faster cars and garbage. Yeah. It means for sure. nothing. That's absolutely. I love what you said about, um, uh, like the, you know, I just love talking about reincarnation, but like learning the lessons and carrying those lessons to the next incarnation. That's how the, the spirit evolves. That's mm-hmm. how consciousness mm-hmm. evolves. Yeah. There's this, there's this actor, I don't remember his name, but, um, do you remember Iron Man one? There was a different actor that played Rhodey. Yeah. That guy is like super into theosophy and, and mysticism and all that stuff. He, he recounts dude. I, and I mean, you know, there's no way to prove this or whatever, but I believe him. He says that he remembers being in the womb, in the womb of his mother, like, like close to his birth. And he remembers frantically thinking, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't wow. forget, don't forget. And the thing that he was trying not to forget is he says that in his former reincarnation, former incarnation, whatever it was, he figured out the uh, formula for the flower of life. Wow. And he, he says he, cool. he remembers frantically, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. And, and that goes right along with all those examples of all those kids who are born and right. remember everything. It's like, yeah, I mean, at this point in my life, reincarnation is the easiest thing for me to believe. It's the answer. It is. I mean, it all only- the, all the, all the hell, all that punishment and eternal reward, all it goes away. All that goes away. It's fear. It's, it's just, fear. It's, just it's, fear. it's, it's, it's lies. It's deception. And like distraction, it, it's distraction. And it makes so much more sense that like, you're just reincarnating here and until you learn how to get it right. Yeah. Guess what, everybody, this might sound weird, but we don't die. We don't die. Not really. This like shell Right. will go away but like your soul will never die truly like you what you really are because we think that we're our personality and yeah. we're the things that we have and whatever but like no the core of who you are it will literally never die ever it's reincarnation it's just gonna keep going and for anybody who's like I, I hear this all the time I, I just casually get in conversations with people and they're like oh man what if you reincarnate into a cockroach that's like the biggest thing right I know Helena I mean not Helena uh, Benjamin Krim in this book I just didn't include the excerpt the author asked him the same thing about eastern reincarnation and he's like well even even the eastern the exoteric yeah. eastern traditions get it wrong and it's a very negative pessimistic view and like in Hinduism they have the caste system you know how like the pinnacle of society is the Brahmin the priest the one but no, I don't remember the names you could look that up if if you wanted to, Alex, it's C A S T E, Hindu caste system. Hindu caste. Yep, system. and it's like it's kind of like they believe that once you're born into this spiritual placement, that's all you will ever be, nothing more, nothing less. Ah. And if you're born as, I think it's like a Dalit, I believe, is which is like the lowest. Like you're you're a peasant, you get nothing from anybody. You're you're a disgusting piece of trash. Yeah. If you reincarnate into that, you're 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 fucked. Right. That's what's believed in a lot of these kind of like Eastern yeah. mainstream religions. But like even Benjamin, Cr- you know, the theosophy is like, no, that's, that's not the whole thing. You don't go backwards. Yeah. You don't reincarnate, you know, backwards as a dog a or whatever. Meat, yeah. You're always evolving upwards. Yeah. You might have lifetimes where, in the last one, you made a lot of progress, and then in the next one, you relapse in your choices. Yeah, but that's because initiation is painful. We'll talk about that later. So, damn, it kind of had it a little upside down. Um, the Brahmins are the priestly class, and then the lowest is the Untouchables. The Untouchables, right? But aren't they called Dalits? I mean, they have a, they have like like Hindu names. Yeah, it goes. It's four Hindu names and then Untouchables. So let me keep looking. Damn, dude. That it's okay. Wild. Yeah, yeah. Just let us know when you find it. So the plan of evolution. This world is in a process of change. It is going through a temporary period of extreme trouble and violence and manifested hatreds. But new energies are pouring into the planet all the time, particularly a great energy from a cosmic avatar called the spirit of peace or equilibrium. Whoa. This avatar works precisely with the law of action and reaction, which we'd call the law of karma. Damn, that is it's, awesome. It's all that stuff we've been talking about on the podcast. It's, uh, you know, about evolving towards higher consciousness and age of Aquarius that we've just kind of intuitively, th- that's that's the whole premise yeah, of like, theosophy. Yeah, and when I hear that, what you just said, like there's not an iota of myself that, that doesn't recognize that as truth. Like I, I feel my intuition feeling comfort why would physical evolution be accepted as true but there's no sort of consciousness evolution you it know makes, what i mean it like, makes no sense yeah it makes no sense yeah. evolution that we're we're not at the peak we're yeah. at the peak of the physical human kingdom yeah 
Yeah, I, I, I believe that. We're evolving into the next kingdom, so to speak. And it talks about that in here. So now this part is very deep. Let's go. It's very fascinating. And I want to express that when we're speaking here about initiation, mm-hmm. we are not referencing people on a Friday night going to some planned ritual where they were a good boy and they remembered their <laughs> Masonic lines. <laughs> right, right, right. And they, they you know, took the pledge 10,000 times and then they go and they have a party where they all sit around in robes around a candle and read funny stuff. This yeah. is, that, that is a fake initiation. That is a metaphorical initiation of people doing plays. They're doing, Honestly, dr- yeah. they're doing dramas to try to understand things that are really deep concepts. When a theosophist speaks of initiation, what they're specifically talking about is entering a doorway of the soul into one of the five evolutionary phases of the spirit between incarnations. Oh. So when we say initiation, what we mean is your soul is evolving into a higher form through these five stages, uh, stages, and and more rapidly than it would. Yes, gotcha. the, the 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 time between the inception of a soul being manifested here in the physical realm and taking the first initiation, so to speak, which according to this, written in the 1970s, there's only like a million people in the world who supposedly have even taken the real first initiation. Um, I think it's probably a lot more now in this day and age. Sure, sure, but but. Not most, but anyway, so the time between the soul being manifested here initially millions of years ago and taking the first initiation is hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. And then the span between the first initiation and the second initiation, they claim is maybe like another 15 lifetimes. And then the third and the fourth initiations can rapidly be taken in one lifetime. And then the fifth initiation, according to theosophy is when you become like Christ Buddha like enlightened like not just enlightened but like rainbow a planet not just rainbow body that's fourth I'm saying a planetary logos that is recognized through the aeons is a name that people whoa strive to be that's the fifth initiation like Christ Krishna Zoroaster all these legendary names that we've been talking about they've supposedly taken the fifth initiation whoa the fourth is you know becoming a master God, or, okay you know, Damn. So the first initiation, okay, so I'm just going to read the excerpt. Each kingdom grows out of the kingdom below it. First is the mineral kingdom, the densest. From that grew the vegetable kingdom. From the vegetable grew the animal kingdom. From the animal kingdom has grown the human kingdom. We owe our body to the animal kingdom. Out of the human kingdom has been growing another kingdom, which we do not recognize unless we are esotericists, which is the spiritual kingdom made up of the masters and the initiates. The spiritual kingdom or kingdom of souls is the kingdom immediately above the human kingdom. You enter it through the human kingdom. As you evolve up to the point where the soul really begins to demonstrate itself through its reflection, who said that? Socrates, know thyself. Uh-huh. Begins to demonstrate itself through its self-reflection, the man or the woman on the physical plane you enter the spiritual kingdom through the doorway of initiation. There are five doors through which you pass to become a master. Eventually, every single soul will become perfect in that same way through incarnations. The first step is the birth of the Christ principle. The whole process is reenacted dramatically in the gospel story, the life of uh, Jesus symbolizing this path of initiation. Of course, it is much older than Christianity. It is almost as old as humanity itself, and it has been presented to humanity over and over again in different ways. Uh, throughout different myths in the past. In the gospel story, the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem is the symbol for the first initiation, which is called the birth at Bethlehem. The birth of the Christ in the cave of the heart or known as the birth of the indwelling Christ. That takes the man or woman into the spiritual hierarchy for the first time and demonstrates control over the physical body. The second initiation is called the baptism and is symbolized by the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan river by john the baptist this demonstrates control over the emotional astral vehicle the third initiation is called the transfiguration and is symbolized by the transfiguration of jesus on the mount for the initiate this is the culmination of the lower process that integrates the three lower vehicles the physical the astral and the mental from the master's point of view this is really the first true initiation because it's the first soul initiation then you go to the fourth which is symbolized by jesus dying on the cross It's called the crucifixion. In the East, it is called the great renunciation, where everything is renounced, even life itself, if necessary, to demonstrate the lifting of the initiate out of matter into the radiance of the light of spirit. 
Jesus went through it on the cross to demonstrate it for us physically to set this great experience of renunciation before the world. This is followed by the resurrection. The resurrection of the body of Jesus on the third day symbolizes the resurrection initiation in which the man, now a master, is freed from the pool of matter forever. The master is in a body which is totally resurrected, a body of light. Every initiation, light body. Every initiation confers on the initiate more and more energy of subatomic particles. By the time he or she is taking the fourth, three quarters of that body is literally light. They always tell the story of Moses or Jesus. You know, they come down from the mountain and they appear to be light. Right, right? yeah. Blinding. Um, mm-hmm. Moses had to wrap his face if you read the Old Testament because apparently he was face to face with light and he was shining light before he went away, you know. Um, the master stands free from the physical planet. Oh, my bad. This is completed at the fifth initiation. The master stands free from the physical planet. He no longer has to incarnate. He is now in a body which is totally transfigured and resurrected in the esoteric sense of the word. Many masters do, in fact, stay on the planet to oversee the evolution of the rest of us, but many go on to higher planets or even out of this system altogether. What are the prerequisites for beginning the initiatory process? That was the question from the interviewer, and the answer is the soul sees that the person is beginning to reflect its qualities on the physical plane, the emotional astral plane, and the mental plane, and is truthfully becoming more altruistic, that its actions are no longer totally governed by his or her personal desires. The personality becomes negative to the soul, meaning the mm, ego. The yeah. ego, you you begin to learn the truth. Like, oh, the ego is terrible. It limits me from it, being who I really am. It's like a prison. Yes. Yeah. You begin to realize this. You begin to shun this and to become more altruistic, which is a fancy word for saying like you're kind, you're mm. compassionate, you're truthful in I, your actions. Yeah. I kind of feel like that's why like on psychedelics, your ego lashes out so hard. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're going to die. You're going to have a bad trip. You're going to have a bad trip. You're going to be trapped like this. It's yeah. not good. This isn't good because it's weak at that point. It Your ego is weak. Yeah. It's thin. Or you're like face to face with it, that, which is the same thing. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, it seeks, oh, the personality becomes negative to the soul and seeks to carry out soul purpose, even though it might not know it is a soul. Then we see a beneficent person who is rather altruistic, who is really looking for and working towards the betterment of humanity. He will have made some service and put others evolution in society as a whole, somewhat higher than his or own, his or her own self. It takes hundreds of thousands of incarnations to even come to the first initiation. Theosophy is very clear about the fact that you you could be you could be not believing in anything and just through the natural evolutionary cycle through many lifetimes get to this point mm-hmm. because you have to understand karma mm-hmm. reincarnation through many lifetimes of suffering and suffering and suffering and coming back here and retaining that soul memory you, you you know everyone will reach the state right whatever you believe it doesn't matter it's the whole you know? point but having the knowledge of it is like you know Think about it like this. It's like having the knowledge of it can make the process quicker. It's like an accelerant. Yes. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, you're aware of it. You can understand how it works, but it's going to happen to everybody. Right. It's like the the lessons will be learned one way or another, even if it's subconscious Mm -hmm. through, it's just like, if you're subconsciously learning these tiny lessons through, in the grand scale, a short lifetime, it's going to take a long time for that soul Many to get lifetimes. there. Yeah, but yeah. if you start digging in and you find the truth, and it's like, oh my God, this is the point. This is what it's all about. Then like, yeah, you start a momentum that your soul is like on a track. Right. And then you can follow that momentum. Now, it's very clear. This, these are things that are in the book that I just didn't write down to read. They make it very clear that once you are aware of this knowledge, or or as you could say from the Garden of Eden, you've been, been made aware of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, like the yeah. serpent. Oh, it brings the, they're not supposed to eat the fruit, but they ate it. Now you're aware of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, when you're aware that karma is a very real force and reincarnation is truly happening to you, but you choose wrong way of action towards others, the karmic devastation is greater. Oh, yeah. I mean... That makes sense to me because that's, I think we actually touched on that on a previous episode. That's like truly one of the most egregious things you can do is like energetically attack someone. Yeah. You know better. Right. So it's going to come back to you. You know, you put your intention to bypass what is right. You know, there's a lot of people who just don't know better. 
bro. I the, mean, or like children. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. like children they don't know better. Make mistakes all the time. That's exactly what we were it, talking yeah. about before. On, the, on a different episode, Alex had brought that up. Right. And, and yeah, and we were talking about that. It's like the Bible says, like, you murder with your mind. Mm-hmm. You, you murder with your intentions. Yeah. With your words. Yes. Yeah. Like it's that's, not the punch that did the damage. It's the, it's the heart that wanted to do it. It's, be, it's because like, like the body doesn't matter. Like you, cool, kill a body. What is that really doing? It's going to incarnate into another. Hey, killing people's not cool. Let me just put that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me put that disclaimer we're, out there. We're speaking you, metaphorically Of course, here. of course. Yeah. But, but you, you, the true evil is intention. Right. Those dark feelings and like. It's also it's also reflective because if I feel these deep dark things about someone else, it comes right back at me. It, mm-hmm. it damages my soul, right. my spirit, and it starts a negative momentum. You gotta. That, it's also like quantum physics. You know, two particles are you know all particles are entangled. Really, I mean, there's 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 only the they proved this. I, I think Australian scientists proved this in 2015 that that quantum entanglement is truly real. Oh yeah. Which what was the theory there? There's truly no physical space and time. It's an illusion that we're observing. Yeah. So like if you think about it, your hatred towards another being. Is That's, your hatred towards yourself? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 like at this point you can't deny it. It's the same reason why you can't truly show love unless you love yourself. Yes. It's the same thing. Yes. You, I believe that wholeheartedly. Same. I do too. Like you can't truly reveal an unconditional, honest love towards others until you learn to feel that towards yourself without yeah. any sort of outside influence. Because you don't even know what it is. Yeah. Unless you can give it to yourself. Yeah, it's you know the most important lessons we learn in this world come from within. Mm-hmm. Like that's why like all the wisdom traditions, everybody, it's all about looking within, because you are everything. You are everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, you know it's, it, it, it already clearly says like that is God. God is everything. Everything inside every atom. Yeah, every, every atom. Everything. Every dust might. It's yeah. God. And that's, yeah. So that's, that's why, that's one of the many reasons why it's so important that you're careful with your thoughts, your energy, you know, your words, your, right. your actions as well. Like y- you are damaging yourself if you are trying to damage other people. Correct. Think it's, about, think about when you get caught up in anger, right? You get caught, it's, it's like addictive. It's like this, this palpable, addictive force of energy but what happens the more you engage in it the more you want to engage in it yep and the more miserable you are yeah the more negative and just complaining and your life collapses around you yeah it's because you're but the problem is people in that state are in so much denial they can't even clearly see that oh no of course not yeah and if you tell them well now they're angry <laughs> Exactly. It's like, it's kind of like being depressed. You don't know that you're depressed until after, <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Yeah. In the moment you're like, <sighs> you could yeah. go by a year and then when you come out of it, you're like, I've been depressed for a year. Yeah. I didn't even know, you know, that's that lack of self-reflection. That's that not showing yourself love. And that's why, you know, so many people say you want to, you want to make things better on the inside, show love outside, show love outside. That's the first step. If you if you if you guys are stuck in a negative rut or whatever, start showing love to the people around you. You know what's mind blowing about that? Do you, I, I know you probably don't remember everything we said in every episode, but do you guys remember in the Karma episode? And I think we talked about this in like the Disney episode, like probably two years ago, where I was just like, I've got this Jiminy Cricket thing here. Let the conscience be your guide. And I've been saying like, man, I have this theory that like, you know, the way to pay off negative karma is by following your conscience. Mm. You remember like me saying that? Yeah. You know where that came from? Just a deep thought. Like I, I didn't, I didn't read. Yeah, intuition. Theosophists say that verbatim. No way. (laughs) Yeah, they don't say it exactly in the language that I say, but the principle is in order to pay off. I think the interview asked him, "How do do you get rid of negative karma?" And he's like, "Oh, you know, service towards others, and and you know, altruistic acts of kindness and love and empathy towards other beings, following your conscience." Because it's hard for this service. This whole physical realm, all we're taught how to do is communicate with others. We're not taught how to communicate with ourselves. You know, so it's so much harder 
to know how to go inside and take care of yourself if you don't have any experience trying to just do selfless, kind things from the outside. It's kind of like this endless cycle of like, take care of yourself, take care of others, take care of yourself, take care of others. You'll get better at both by doing both. Yeah. You'll get better at taking care of yeah. yourself by being as nice. As well, so yeah. By being nice to others. You'll get better at being nice the, to if, others. If, it's like, it's like, it's like if you, if you nurture that energy outwards, it's going to nurture it inwards. But if you nurture it inwards, it's going to nurture it outwards. Yep. It's, it's as above, so below. It's like, yeah. but if, if you, if you nurture both, yeah. you know, like, yeah. So, the, you know, we say like, you can't love somebody until you love yourself. Well, if you don't know how to love yourself, you don't know where to start. Just start being nice to people around you. Just start doing selfless things. Just be kind, listen to people. And then you know, treat yourself, uh, treat others as you would want to be treated. The golden rule. Yeah. Just be kind to people. They mentioned the golden rule in this book. Wow. That's and then profound. like, they basically say that like the, 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 the masters of wisdom or the, the, you know, the, 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 the great white brotherhood or whatever, they won't even take somebody into their like tutelage or communication or whatever until it's proven that the initiate's heart is altruistic and has at least been through like the second incarnated initiation or uh -huh. something. And like they say that to know if someone has taken the first initiation is if there is at least a kernel of motivation to cease negative, harmful uh, acts either to yourself or to others addictions wow. the earnest desire to be better that wow. is evidence of the first initiation the second initiation supposedly according to theosophy is beginning to develop the mastery right and it's right. apparently they say it takes like so many lifetimes between the first and the second because the first initiation is when your soul clicks and that light comes on and you're like i i need to be better so i want to be better it's like the first step is be kind that, well, the, no, the first step is releasing the denial that like, yeah, I mean, be kind is a part of it, it's but it's, just, yeah. but it's, it's the, the, it's the, it's the acknowledgement. It's the attempt to be more altruistic, to stop getting, you know, if there's something that's causing you addictions or pain or suffering or others, you know, to try to shun that. And then they say the soul will relapse and you know through so many lives until it finally stabilizes and takes mastery over the emotional body mm. and controls emotional reactions and is like okay like i'm i am in control of myself that part's hard to do it is <laughs> that's why there's supposedly so many lives between that makes sense to me it's hard to learn that lesson it seems like it would be too hard to learn that lesson in one lifetime exactly it, it, it really does exactly i've been through periods of my life where like i'm good at doing that and then like I'll slip into a bad mode of where I'm right back where I was, where I'm being, you know, not anywhere near as kind. I'm not thinking of others. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, man, I thought I was I thought I was doing good there. It, it, I feel like there's no way you could possibly learn that in a lifetime. In one lifetime. No way. Yeah. No but, way. You know, uh, the good news is apparently everybody will get there. You know, yes. so the point is you have the knowledge work towards it. That's all you can do. Yeah. But, um, and, and this book goes into so much more detail about all of this. I, I took like, like a paragraph each section, <laughs> you know, and there, and there are so many books about this, but anyway, so, um, moving on from that, the masters of wisdom, it's like, who are the masters of wisdom? They are our elder brothers, by the way, when my dad was first taken by these beings, he always told me that they gave him the sense or the impression that they were like family, like his brothers. Wow. Like when they walked him out towards where the lady was, he said that they gave him the sense that they were his brothers, like his spiritual brothers. Um, they are our elder brothers. They have gone ahead of us, having finished the evolutionary journey on which we are still engaged, have taken upon themselves the responsibility of overseeing our evolution. They teach the correct way. The correct way is the way of selflessness, lack of ego. This is the hard way. It's slow because we are all so egotistical. One of them everybody knows, the Master Jesus, 
and Palestine was a very advanced disciple, a fourth degree initiate, just short of a master. He took the fourth initiation, the crucifixion, openly on the outer plane. Normally, you're not expected to die on a cross when you take the fourth initiation. <laughs> he did that to symbolize for us dramatically that great experience of renunciation. He is now a master, becoming a master in his immediate next life as Apollyonis of Tyana. That's a real historical figure who was like involved with like Christian writings. Whoa. Um, who opened an ashram in North India where he is buried. From that fact has come the legend that somehow Jesus didn't die on the cross, that he was secreted out of Palestine, uh, secreted, uh, not secreted, <laughs> <laughs> secreted out of Palestine and went to India and is buried there. It was this being who was Jesus, but in his next incarnation as Apollyonis, Jesus is now a very advanced master. Um, the Christ. The Orthodox view is that he is the one and only son of God. Actually, there's no such person. There's never been and there never will be such a person. Every single man, woman, and child in the world is a son or a daughter of God. Yeah. Every one of us has in potential that divinity. There's only one divinity and we all share it. The only difference between the Christ and ourselves, the Buddha and Krishna or and ourselves, or excuse me, the Buddha or Krishna and ourselves, is that they have manifested their divinity. They know that they are sons of God and they demonstrate it. Damn. We do not know that we are sons of God. We are taught otherwise by the church. Absolutely. We are taught that we are born in sin and only in the agency of Jesus can we know God. This is wrong. They're forcing us into idol worship. Yep. They're forcing us into pagan practices of putting an image. This is just me speaking. Sure, the sure, book. sure. They're forcing us into depicting Jesus as being cut up and sliced and fucking diced yeah. and bleeding out on a cross. And we're supposed to worship this icon of our God dying. And it's it, sick. And in the same book, it says, take no idols. Yeah. Like Jesus said that. Yeah. The guy that they're idolizing. The dude. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's sick. It's just, it's honestly black magic. Absolutely. It's sick. It, it, it really is. And like, I don't, I don't want to get too deep conspiracy here, but like if, if, if there was some dark force out there, the Vatican, or, or I mean a spiritual force, a, oh, right, a, an right. energetic, a dark energetic. They talk, that's the next section. That's a pretty efficient tool at getting people to look away from the truth. Yeah. Think about it, man. Like the tithes and offerings. You know what's crazy, man? I've all, I, I, sometimes I think, like, apparently I'm wrong, according to Theosophy. They have their own explanation of the Antichrist, which I think is brilliant. I want to hear that. It's next. It's next. But my, uh, one time I was thinking, like, you know, when you really think about it, look, I, it's no secret, almost 100 episodes in, like, how much I revere the life and the story of Jesus. Oh, I'm yeah. Not, I'm not, like, I'm not, like, anti- you know, no, you got to hit him with the quote. Come on, he, he's the most bad to the bone sage of all time. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not like say the line. Say the line. <laughs> say the line. And he's jacked, and you know, he's, natty he's, lights, he's natty lights, yeah. and you know, all that. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not like. I just want to be very clear. Like, I'm not like anti Jesus. I'm not anti not at all Christians. I'm no. anti corporate establishment. Like. Yeah overlord tyrannical Christianity that says you're going to burn in hell flame forever. If you like think a little different, you know, or whatever, whatever, yes. whatever. Same. But sometimes I wonder if that Christian system in place, which is like the dominant paradigm of the world for so many more uh, years, like what if that was truly the antichrist? Dude, I, that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. I didn't want to offend, you know, I, I, I was like, that might, that might make people a little uncomfortable, but you know, it, it is an interesting thought to kick around. That's kind of what I meant by like, that's yeah. a, that's a powerful tool. You know what I'm saying? It's like the, the, the Bible talks about the antichrist and, and Satan and these dark forces distracting from the truth and all this stuff. It's like, all right, let's follow that thread. If, if, uh, at one point it talks about Lucifer, I mean, he was in the highest order of angels, right? He's extremely powerful, extremely intelligent and all this stuff. You think that he would, if he, if he, you know, devoted his existence to defying, you know, God or Jesus or whatever, you think he's just going to like get cast down and then just like chill and be in hell and like, Oh, I guess that's it. That's it. Whatever. Or is he going to be, like, real tricky about it? Real tricky. You know, and, and I don't, it's, it's dangerous waters. I don't believe that. I don't. 
it's interesting to think about. That's yeah. all. I, I'm not telling you that the Bible is evil. I'm not telling you that Christianity is evil. Yeah, I, it's, I, it's, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable it's not, it's going the, that it's far. The, yeah, it's natural that every system that takes place on this earth has a hierarchical, hierarchical power structure that is almost certainly always corrupt at the top. For sure. In exactly. every in every field. Everything. Even in education, bro. You yep. see you you hear stories of like superintendents doing shady shit uh, over schools. You know what I yep. mean? Or governors or, or or your local mayor doing shady shit. Every system is corrupt. Yeah, why is them. why is why are the religious systems oh, exempt no, 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 from no, no, that? No, 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 they're not. Not us. It's it's pure true gospel. Yeah, exactly. It's like listen, there are some incredible, beautiful, profound things about the life of Jesus and the Bible. All I implore the listener is like, focus on those things. Right. Focus on those beautiful, incredible things. Don't focus on like hell and burning forever and Satan and all this, like whatever. Just focus on the good. Focus on the good. Amen. Fo- amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. And amen. Amun, by the way, where that comes from. Amun, amun Ra. Ra. Yep. Yep. So, um, I've got two more, or actually three more sections here, um, but they're nowhere near as long, at least some of them. The Antichrist, it's, it's just to make it very simple. There's more information on this, but I didn't want to. The Antichrist is Mr. Beast. We know that. We don't, we don't have, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. There are actual conspiracy theories uh, yeah, yeah. that Mr. Beast is the Antichrist, and I find it so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny. It's it so is. funny. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, I, I'm dying to know According to Theosophy, the Antichrist is not a man. If it ever was a man, they say it's Emperor Nero. It, 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 it already, it's an energy that incarnated in the form of Emperor Nero. And actually, what's funny about that, I learned this in college when I was doing religious studies, that the real mark of the beast is not 666, but it's 616. And it's a gematria cipher for the name Nero. And you have to understand, the first gospel ever recorded, you know, pub, uh, mainstream gospel. There was a document called Q. It's a long, nerdy academic story. There was a document called Q that came out many years before the other gospels. They all were reading it and pulled from it and published the gospels with this information. The first gospel, the gospel of Mark was written in the year 69 AD. Well, what happened in 70? That's when the Romans like came and destroyed uh, the temple. It was like hell on earth. The Jews thought it was the end of the world. They right. were being slaughtered yeah. by the church. I mean, the, um, not the church at the time, but you know, the Romans. Right. So they were writing a secret cipher about this antichrist being the emperor of the time, Nero. Whoa. That happened 2000 years ago. Yeah. Everybody's like there's a man, there's it's it's this guy, it's that guy. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? It's not true. Now, in no, modern yeah. times, according to theosophy, in modern times, the antichrist has already came and gone long before we were even born. And it was in the form of World War 1 and World War 2. Whoa. And it's already gone. Whoa. It. It's gone. Now is the time of Aquarius for the Christ energies to be returning and guiding us to- towards enlightenment. That that blew my mind. That, because, I mean, can you think of a more evil, disgusting time? In millions human- upon millions of people were slaughtered in those two wars. You want to hear a crazy fact? They were fact? only a few years apart. Dude, you want to hear a crazy fact? You know when the airplane was invented? Uh, 1912? 19, well, it was, te- it was invented in 03. It was like, right, right, 1903. It was like commercialized yeah. in 11 or 12. You know when we dropped a bomb out of a plane? When? 1945, less than 50 years after we made the plane. Yeah, that's insane. That's disgusting. Weren't they using them in World War One for guns on them, or am I wrong on that? Were they not? Re- there were there were like machine like guns. I'm talking, but I'm, I'm talking about like, like nukes and mass shit. death. Yeah. yeah, within 50 years, in an instant, hundreds of thousands of lives disappearing. So you want to yeah. talk about human progress, like progress? That's your progress. That's progress. You, you, the powers that be's progress. That's what I'm saying. Like yeah. that, that. If you you want to talk about physical progress versus spiritual, that's what physical process progress gets us. It's it's mind blowing. Anyway, Sick. I'm sorry. I have two right. more sections here, and then we'll we'll give them a break. But um, <laughs> origin of man, early animal man, not quite truly human, but no longer simply animal, had reached a certain point in its evolution with a strong coordinated feeling body, and at minimal a sentient or feeling astral body, and the germ of a mind an incipient mind that would later form the nucleus of a mental body. When that point was reached 18 and a half million years ago, the human soul is waiting on the soul plane for just this moment in evolution incarnated for the first time in these animal men. 
That is the fall from paradise of Adam and Eve. It was a metaphor. The whole thing is a metaphor. It was not a fall from grace, but it was a deliberate part of the plan of evolution that the human souls had to give up paradise, living in pralaya, it's an Eastern term, a wonderful paradise, a wonderful paradise, that's hard to say, paradisaical, 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 paradisaical state of endless bliss and eat of the fruit of tree of knowledge. Uh, it's in quotes, obviously. It's a metaphor. Right. Which is to take incarnation on the physical plane in these as yet animal men. So all the, all the garden of Eden, all that is a metaphor. It, it, it's not, it's not literal. Right. Right. Of course. Um, this is what happened that has been misinterpreted as a fall of grace, that Lucifer was a great angel, but he rebelled against God and thought he was good as God and so was put out of heaven. It's a story. It's only a story, totally misinterpreted. It is really a story of the incarnation of the human evolution. Mm -hmm. Evolution is sped up through meditation and service. These are the two levers of the evolutionary process. Nothing moves you forward faster than correct scientific meditation and powerful altruistic service to the world. Oof. The soul comes into incarnation in the first place to serve the plan of evolution. It is the aware, it is uh, it is aware of the plan of the logos of the planet, and it seeks in every way to carry out that plan. The major aspect of that plan is the spiritualization of matter, which the soul does by entering into incarnation. So, like at, at the, the the basic premise here is every incarnate soul at the very most remote minute place deep in the psyche in the subconscious mind desperately is seeking to help serve creation in this plan of evolution but most of us are so traumatized by our waking lives and all this bull crap from this hellish material world that we chose to come to it takes so many hundreds of thousands of lifetimes to think about gnosis that that light flicks on uh. you take that first initiation you know the truth oh my god i've just been reincarnating the whole time God. That's the truth. Or as they said in the lighthouse, remember the light? And it's like Prometheus brought this light you yeah. know, and then was punished. It's all a metaphor. But So then this is the last part, and I saved this for last. It's, it's, it's towards the end of the book, but I saved it for last anyway because I figured if you got to this point in the episode, you're probably really interested. And um, this is the most controversial part. And I do think that it's important as, you know, beings who potentially are seeking enlightenment to understand that you can listen to or entertain or read material from a point of detachment, which means you're controlling your emotional reaction, hearing information, you know, and you're not letting it control you. Uh -huh. you're, you're not letting it, you know, rile you up. You're not letting it freak you the fuck out because you're in control. You know, you're on the path to become a master. But Lucifer is a large part of theosophy uh -huh. from a metaphorical perspective. Right. And this is the reason that I spent so long waiting to dive into theosophy. Cause I was like, I don't want to deal with that. I don't, I don't know what to think of that. Like, fuck yeah, that. And, and people are so touchy uh, about like the name and, and you know, whatever, but we're, we're coming from the, at this from a perspective of like, this is I'm just trying to find answers. Exactly. We're it, like you said, detached. And they make it very clear that this is not some form of worship. This is not an entity. They make, uh, I mean, not that it's not an entity, but it's not like a God that is worshiped. Right, See, right. When I first ever heard of theosophy, the, the lens in which I understood it to be was, it was like Luciferian devil worship. Ooh. And it's because this kind of conversation is in it. But then when you listen to what it's saying, it's like, not that way at all. So I'll just read this part from the book. But in popular culture, and certainly to a degree in religions, the Antichrist, Satan, and Lucifer are personified. Uh -huh. It makes for great drama, of course. But what is the esoteric view of Satan or Lucifer? Satan is what we call the Antichrist, the forces of material out, the uh, the forces of materiality. Uh, there's not an actual devil with a pitchfork. Right, right, there's right, there's right. not a being. Yeah. There's not one singular entity actually truthfully powerful enough to have control over the entire collective consciousness of all of us right, wonderful right, light beings. Right, right. It's a joke that's, yeah. that's created to ensnare us and keep us in fear. It's an energy. It's 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 the energy that is trying to hinder our evolutionary progress towards light or towards, you know, God. It's like the Chirons from Greek mythology. Or sorry, Archons. Yeah, the Archons. from Gnosticism. Exa they're trying to keep, yeah. keep our souls here. It's trying to trap you and like don't don't look towards the light yeah, i know? need a new car i need a new house exactly like, yeah 
Satan is what we call the Antichrist, the forces of materiality. These have the role of upholding the matter of the planet. Lucifer is seen by the Christian groups as the devil. It's nothing of the kind. Lucifer is really the name of the great angel who ensouls the human kingdom. Every human soul is an individualized part of one great oversoul. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk about that all the time. How we're all pieces of one thing. But what this is saying, the name of that great oversoul, which is divine, is Lucifer. Ah. So what they're saying, the metaphor or the story of this being of light falling from perfect spiritual reality into the material world Whoa. is us. Whoa. And, and think about what the Bible says. Like, like the Bible says that like Satan or Lucifer is the king of the earth. He's, he's like, this is his kingdom. It's us. That's wild. So who is the devil? There is no individual devil. You could say that the opposite of good is the devil, and that is also mm -hmm. inside every one of us. Mm -hmm. The greed, the selfishness, the greedy personality expression of individuals, but in esoteric terms, deeply, profoundly, the devil or the forces of evil or the forces of materiality have a role of looking after the fires of the planet. The planet is a living, breathing entity, which is what the lady told my dad. Um, these fires are controlled scientifically. Otherwise, they would explode and the planet would be destroyed. The whole thing works under law. The lords of materiality, having the role of upholding the matter of the planet, work with the subhuman evolution or the subhuman devic evolution, which is like a spiritual kind of entity. The elementals on the involutionary arc to carry out that work. They are not content with that, but overflow onto the evolutionary arc, and that is where the evil comes in. We are esoterically speaking or for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear if you understand that the truth is in metaphor we are esoterically lucifer rebelling against our perfect spiritual nature before we incarnated here damn falling into matter being imprisoned here but we are also equally and remember everything is duality yeah we are also christ right right and that is the way that we evolve back towards god so it's like we were punished, you know, hypothetically speaking, but they, yes. they're clear that it's all a metaphor and it's not real. Well, and you're, you're literally describing, I mean, what that says right there in, in no way like glorifies Lucifer or like any of that. It's still the core message is still be like Christ. It's not, it's not like, yeah, that's funny that you thought it was like Luciferian worship. Or like something. years ago <laughs> right, 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 when right, I yeah. first heard about it. Right, right. It, it's and, and it doesn't help that in the 1800s when Helena Blavatsky published her first magazine, she called it Lucifer. Oh, Why wow. did she do that? Because Shock. she was shocking people. Yeah. And like, that's what I was saying. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily think she got a lot of pushback and it's like, I hate to say it, honey, but you had it coming. <laughs> and you know, it's funny now, but like, yeah, I like the later material because it's a sure. lot more direct. Like this is what we're actually about. Yeah. You know, this is what we're about people. And, um, it's, it's fascinating, really deep stuff. And, um, it, I mean, yeah, the core message is still just like, be like Christ still, you're, you're still moving towards the good. You're still like, there's, there's nothing in there that you just read that suggests that we, it's like, well, you're Lucifer. So just be Lucifer and be, you know, materialistic and bad. And no, it's still like, that's, that's the distraction. This is the distraction. Yeah. It's literally Go like away you from have that. to take control over your different, it, it, it basically is talking about in the deeper levels of information, like initiation, human and solar, very fascinating book, very high level. Um, I had to put it down because I was like, I, I got to read through this other stuff first before it. And, um, it's, it's, it, it talks about like the, the, the level of consciousness that you are seeking to manifest on all planes of reality. Think uh, about this. Everything everywhere all at once. That's movie. Dude, dude, she's 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 becoming a master in every of her known universes. It's like theosophy when you think about it. But how is she becoming a master? Through through altruism. Being kind. Through joy. Through and kind, she learns through, that from her husband who is like, this is how I fight. He's like, yeah. you fight your way, I fight by being kind. And she learned that from him and that's when she finally ascends. Right. Oh, that's so cool. That is so cool. Yeah, I mean, the core message is still like, no, don't be like Lucifer. Yeah, don't, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Don't. You, you were like that. That's why you're here. Ugh. 
Wow, bro. Yeah, like the fact that that could be so misconstrued, it's just because it's a, a hot button word that right. people get freaked out about or whatever. It's still saying, don't be like that. That's why I was saying, like, you're seeking to become a master, control your emotions. And, and when a, information is being presented to you, understand that only you are in control of yourself and how you react. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And just because you say a word doesn't mean that... Oh, my life's <laughs> over. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it is what it is. That's it's just a beautiful message. It's just another metaphor of how we can be better. Yeah. Move away from the Lucifer. Move towards the Christ. That's it. And I'm like pretty open about the fact that I don't think truthfully people should worship anything or anyone. Right. The, you know, it's like if you were to worship anything, worship the force of love. You know what I mean? Embody love and like shine that into other beings. I like that a lot. All you really need to know is that yes, God is real, but like you are, you know, if, if you thought of, if understand this, any speck of light that you see with the human eye, that's 60 photons minimum. Yeah. 60 photons is the minimum requirement for you to be able to observe physical light. So think about that. Okay. Wow, that's 60 photons. All 60 of those minute, imperceptible particles of light are bonding together so that we can observe even a tiny speck of light. That's our soul to God. We are all those tiny little photons, but God is all of the light collected combined wow. that's 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 how it works we we are all it's like we're the lens in which quote unquote god sees reality through or sees yeah. experiences through. manifested reality wow yeah. dude i want to read this book um you can get it for 99 cents on kindle oh i'll do that you can also find it free online and it's not long I might try to find a used copy somewhere. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I like. Yeah, that, yeah, you know. yeah. But um, that's that's all I got. So. Damn, bro, my gears were spinning this whole episode. That 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 was thought provoking. Yeah, it's a good read too. Damn, that was like super inspiring. And there's way, dude. I did, okay, one last thing. <sighs> okay, okay, go, go. Truly, one last yeah. thing. Yeah. And I told you about this last week on Xbox, and you were like, what the fuck? <laughs> but uh, the, they, they have a really crazy uh, kind of far out there view. I haven't fully accepted this because, like, again, I resonate with most of this material, but I believe, like, you have the right to be detached when studying things and allow yourself to, uh, you know, process things. You don't right. have to necessarily accept things. Right. Like, even in 2012, when my dad told me about the lady, it took me years to truly understand it. I've not seen her. You know what I mean? Right. I've only ever talked about her with my dad. I, anyway, it took me years to understand and accept that. I believed he was telling me the truth. It took me years to accept. Yeah. So this is something that I have yet to accept, but it's so fascinating. So the theosophists claim that as in the Western world and in the Eastern world are two very different. Basically, they're like two different realities, bro. Like when you think about it, they are. They really are. We're like, we're like two different worlds on one plane. Yeah. And like in the East, that office that reflects the pinnacle of God's reflection through mankind is the Buddha, mm-hmm. right? And then in the West, that's the Christ. Yeah. But the theosophists go to say that in the great new age that's coming, there's going to be a new office that returns called the Maitreya that is an incarnate soul right. that has the the incarnation of the wisdom of Buddha and the love of Christ, or rather Buddha is the wisdom of God and Christ is the love of God. They are claiming that the Maitreya is a being that will incarnate, that will have both energies present and one who will unite the whole world into a new knowledge. That's so cool. <laughs> so it's the first time ever hearing this like a week or two. Ago, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I've heard it like I've re- someone mentioned that to me before a long time ago and I was like, bullshit. <laughs> you know? but like, it's deep, dude. So they, 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 the theosophists really do believe in the second coming of Christ, like literally like a yeah. human incarnation. And they believe he already came in the 1970s as a guy named, um, let me think of his name. Uh, Krishnamurti. They believe he already came. What? I got to look. Okay, I have to look into that person. Yeah, Krishnamurti. It was a real person. You can look him up. If, 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 if We could look it up after. Sure. Yeah. But he's a real person. That I think he was born in India, and he he went around the world, like but like press conferences, like like teaching like theosophical shit. Oh, that's Am so I cool. saying I believe this man is Christ? No, but right. they claim it. Yeah. 
It's super interesting. It's crazy. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. Deep. The super deep. <laughs> That's all I got. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. That was amazing. Great job, Ryan. That was sick. Thanks. Uh, love you guys. Love you guys. Bye, y'all. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, check out our other videos. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Peace. Peace.